Okay, so hi everyone. Um, very happy to be here. My name is um, Eric. I'm working for Zalando. Zalando is an online fashion store where you can buy all sorts of clothes, shoes and all. Um, but what you might not know about Zalando is that it's also a huge tech company. So we have like 2,000 engineers and we are even recruiting more. We are producing lots and lots of software, not only for the website, but also for all the warehouses, the data science, lots of things that are really interesting. So if you're interested in knowing more about Zalando, please come and see me after the talk. I will be very glad to explain. Um, but before I start, I would like to know um, what are you doing in your daily programming? And especially, what is your main programming language? So can you just raise your hand if you are using one of those programming languages as your, like your main programming language? So it's like almost everyone, right? So who is using like a very obscure programming language that is not here? Like APL or something, what are you using? PHP, oh wow. Okay, so then that brings me to my next question. So, who is using a statically typed language? Uh, that's yeah, probably a majority. Uh, so, dynamically typed? Who doesn't even know what it is? <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so probably your, most of you are in the statically typed camp. So, this is actually what I'm using nowadays. Um, um, I'm using Haskell. And Haskell is quite different from many of the languages that were on the previous slide and quite interesting. But I didn't start with Haskell. I mean, it was not, I didn't get an illumination one morning, woke up and say, oh, I should use Haskell. I had a very long journey to come to it. And this was my first um, programming project uh, professionally. So this thing here is a PIBX where you can install in companies, in cinemas, to connect all sorts of phones. And this is a pretty complicated beast, right? The, the software for this thing is complicated. It's actually so complicated that there's even a software to configure what should go inside the box in the first place. So a customer says, I want 100,000, 1,000 phones with those functionalities. And there's a software just to configure that. What should we put in that box? And that was the project I was on. And it was a C++ project with something that was incredible. It had as its main methods, it, with the main logic for configuring that thing was a 2,000 lines method, uninterrupted, with just a bunch of comments. And I had to use object orientation and all my OO skills of a French limited engineer to refactor that thing. And that was a great project. I, I really loved it. It was really, for me, the way to test this OO thing, because I was really convinced that OO was the thing, was the way to go. When you think about OO, you think about modeling the world by finding some entities, finding how they communicate together, and you have this thing about inheritance, where it's so obvious that something is another thing, and they have this parent-child relationship. That's the great thing. I was a really strong believer in OO. I was even more also a believer of UML, like, oh, I know this, the soft, software is, is complex. So one way to tackle this complexity is to use OO and encapsulation, and also put some images on top of it. We need some diagrams, otherwise we cannot understand what's going on. So I tried really hard on that project to use UML, to reverse engineer the code, to keep the code in sync with the UML diagrams, and it was like really crazy times. But, you know what? I was actually successful. So I finished this project. We were able to refactor this crazy method, define nice object abstractions, and eventually we were able to evolve that software again because it was really blocked. And as a young engineer, I was, I was thrilled. I thought, oh, I have the universal tool to help me to solve all the problems in the world. But then the doubts started. I had other projects with Java and its you know, like evil cousin, which was just getting started. And I started different projects, and I must say that my success rate went from 100% to more like 50%. And I mean, there are many reasons for this. Uh, there, some of them, you could say this the language or the technology was not really mature. Uh, some of them were just due to project management and agile. All the agile methodologies were just getting started at the time. But when you have such a success rate that is quite low, frankly, after a few years, 
I started looking at other things, and I, I tried to come back to like the roots of my work, which is like, okay, how do I even program? What does that mean to program? So I started looking at other things, and at that time, Ruby was, was a thing, and that already expanded my mind a lot. Wow, you can do all these things with, with Ruby. You can create DSLs, uh, have very compact expressions. You can iterate on collections using map and filter and collect stuff. It's, that's great. I was really amazed. And because I was mostly working on a JVM, there was Groovy at the same time. And Groovy was like uh, giving me the same kind of capabilities. And for me, it was, wow, I'm amazed. Wow, all the things I can do now, this power at, at my fingertips. That felt really great, except for one thing that was really important to me, the types. <laughs> so I had a Groovy project. I developed that thing. I was more or less happy with it, and I came back to it six months later, I could not understand one thing. It was really frustrating. So, after a while, something else crossed my path, it was Scala. That was great, like the types, the JVM, all this expressiveness, and many of the things that I didn't know about, and mostly about functional programming. So I took this very long journey of learning the concepts, trying them out, uh, sometimes failing, sometimes succeeding, doing some open source with it, sharing it with other people. And I've been very happy with Scala for a long time. Um, except that Scala is not Haskell. And when you want to do functional programming, really Haskell is a better choice. So today, I want to show you that after doing this journey, I kind of reflected to this journey, and I realized that Haskell, which is a language that has been around forever, like 28 years, it's not as if it was uh, born yesterday, I kind of realized that it, it, many of the concepts you find in Haskell are actually influencing other programming languages. Because the Java I knew when I started is not the Java there is now, and you can see all the evolutions of Java kind of driven by what you can find in Haskell. So, what is so particular about Haskell? Um, so, this is Michael Snowman, he's a very famous Haskell developer presenting about Haskell, and this is what he lists as the main characteristics of, um, of Haskell. So, it's functional language, statically typed, has garbage collections, okay, nothing new here. But there are two very important um, characteristics in that list, and that make it, makes it a, a very specific language. So, first of all, it's a lazy language, which is pretty unnatural. Most of the languages, when they have to evaluate a function, they start by evaluating the arguments to the function, and then they evaluate the function. That's strict evaluation. Haskell people decided that they would not, do, um, they, they would not use this. Um, and it was just not because they, would, they like to do things differently. Is that because when you have a language that's lazy, there are some patterns of coding that are just nice. So you can, you can, very ha you can have very easily infinite lists. It's not a problem. You have one dot dot, you don't specify, and it's an infinite list, and you don't really care because it's just evaluated when you will need it. And there are, there are very useful patterns that you can do with this. But another reason why they wanted this language to be lazy is that because they said that helped them keep the language pure. And they wanted Haskell to be a language that was purely based on functions. It just program with functions. To me, that's the simplest definition of what is functional programming. And a function is something that takes an input, does something with it, returns an output. And there are rules. You cannot check the, the, the state of the world outside of the inputs. The only thing you can examine are your inputs. And you are not allowed to modify anything else, but you, you can, the only thing you can do is return your output. It's quite a simple idea, actually, right? But it turns out that if you try to program with just this simple idea, there are all sorts of consequences that unfold. And, and that led the people doing Haskell to invent some of the mechanisms they, they were not thinking about when they started. Like, how do you even do I.O., which is all about reading state from the world and writing to the world, right? So they had to invent some techniques, and that, that was very uh, fruitful in that sense. So what does that mean, programming with functions for other languages? All the ones I've listed before. What, what, do, do they have functions? Are they using functions in any shape or form? Um, very uh, nowadays, you see some some um, some articles saying, "Hey, by the way, you can use functions in Java." So Haskell people, for for them, it's it's just yeah, what, what the deal? I know it's nice, 
And the, the article goes on listing all the advantages of using functions in Java. No side effects, very easy to test, very easy to move around, no, no concurrency issues. I mean, it's like the best thing you can have. So, I mean, in any Java project, if you find one of those, please extract it, put it somewhere. Uh, it's just the perfect candidate for a piece of reusable software. It's so nice. Um, but in a way, functions were I have been present in, in Java and object orientation for quite a while. I mean, if you look at a, a book like the Design Patterns book, many of the patterns already describe some sort of functions, some ways of taking functions, moving them around, and so on, with the command pattern, the action template method. And even in the JDK, you find things that look like functions already, like a comparator interface or a callable interface or a file filter. All those things are like examples of functions. But what was really missing uh, from Java and that Haskell has had forever, because it's a functional language, is functions really as first-class entity. Something that is really generic, just from A to B, that's encoded in the types, and that you can move around, that you can use as a parameter to something else. And that, that opens all sorts of possibilities. And one thing that opens in particular is uh, nice streaming libraries. So a much better collection library where you can have, oops, that went too fast, where you can have map, filter, distinct, all those operators to act on a collection of elements. It's much nicer to write this code than to have to iterate over a collection of elements, to have some variables, to keep some state, and so on. You can write some code that's much more concise, much more testable, uh, easier to read and maintain. But again, for Haskell people, uh, what's, it's not very new, right? I mean, even the syntax is, is a lot better and cleaner to do that thing, um, which is quite nice. And also, in Java, there are some pitfalls. So I, I took from the same cheat sheet about how to use streams. Whoa, there are pitfalls. Be careful. You have mutability. Oh, yes. And in Haskell, you don't have mutability. But you can see that Java people, they know about the mutability issues. So it's, you, you will find very frequently articles. I mean, there was a talk about immutability, right? About be careful with mutation. There was a full talk about that, how to use immutable uh, Java objects. And even someone like uh, Josh Bloch, um, in his book about effective Java, said, whoa, don't mutate your data unless you have some very good reason to do so, because if you mutate your data, you will have problems with um, threads or um, concurrency in general. You might put some mutable data as a key to a hash map. That's very bad. Who did that already? Yeah, that's very bad, huh? OK, bad bugs. Um, so we discover something that Haskell people have known for forever, again, that, well, immutable data structures, they are pretty cool. So what that means is that Progressively in the JVM world and elsewhere, people are, are kind of rediscovering all the advantages of having pure functions on one hand and immutable data on, on the other end. And where the, the paradigm for programming is more like you create some data, you transform it, and you consume it, you put it somewhere else. It's like having a huge function doing something, and that function can be composed of smaller functions. And many of the business apps, many of the apps or, or services that we, that we create can be more or less crammed into this paradigm, right? And for functional programmers, that's just the way they see the world. They don't see the world as objects communicating with each other. That's, that's how they see the world. So we need to talk about data. Again, this is not so much of, a, of big news for on, on the Java platform, in a way, because data in its simplest form existed for quite a while. So you have things like POJOs. Well, yeah, it's, a, it's just a bunch of fields, right? Or DTOs, data transfer objects, where it's not really an object. It's more like, again, uh, a, a set of fields that you need to transfer from one place to another, or value objects. But the thing is to manipulate this data um, efficiently, to declare it with the, the least ceremony possible, uh, you have to have some of the things that already, again, exist in Haskell and that have been imported in other languages. So in Scala, you have something called a case class and its companion object. It's a way to very easily declare 
some, some bare data with fields and each field as a type. And you get for free methods like equal, hash code, to string, the kind of thing that you would need, generally need an IDE to generate. This comes for free. You don't have to do anything. And also in Scala, you can put many of them in the same file. You don't have to put one in each file. Uh, so it's very convenient to crea create this, this, uh, these data classes. This support for just pure data is so useful that now you find it in Kotlin. So there are data classes in Kotlin. And people doing Clojure will say, well, no big deal, because we've been using maps and lists forever. It's not a problem for them. It's just like they are universal objects. They already have it. And I was quite surprised when I prepared this talk to read this blog, blog post, like uh, last month. Brian Gotts is proposing data classes for Java. So I think this is, again, a testament that Haskell, with this way of seeing the world, is slowly uh, transpiring to other languages. And people see an, advantages, an advantage of creating data and just having a, some facility for just dealing with this concept, just pure data. Again, um, Haskell is really a language that's design designed to do this. So this is how you declare uh, it's a Boolean data type in Haskell. You need a bit more ceremony, even in a language like Scala, to do the same thing. So, uh, but still, it's good that you can do it. Now, an interesting part. You have functions on one hand, you have data on the other end, and it uh, opens, again, a new world, new possibilities that you might not even think about. And especially one thing, which is pattern matching. Um, this is uh, Steve Yeager, and he wrote a blog post a few years ago uh, where I learned about pattern matching. Never learned about that before. So in his blog post, he was describing how they had this internal uh, Amazon contest for coding and coding challenges. And he said, whoa, the Haskell guys, wow, they did something great. In just one line, they were able to take in a list of lists just the elements that were important to solve the problem, extract them, give them a name, and then write a condition based on those names. Problem solved. Whereas in Java, you would have to open several if, then, else, check if you're respecting the boundaries of your list and things like that. And, and it will be a lot more tedious to write this kind of code. So something like pattern matching has been from the beginning in Haskell, because you have data, you want ways to extract it. And now it's coming to other languages. So you have it in Swift. So you have it in C Sharp. And guess what? It's coming to Java. It's coming to a Java near you. Great. So you will have data classes. You will have pattern matching. Um, there might still be a reason why people are not, did not do, is, do this from the beginning, is that as a language implementer, pattern matching is still something that is hard to get right. Uh, look at the Scala bug tracker, if you want, for pattern matching, matching bugs. You will see lots of them. Uh, it's hard to get right. It's hard to make it performant and so on. So lots of research needs to get into this thing to, to, to get it right. Even in Haskell, it's only until some very recent Haskell versions that they were able to have a more complete way of pattern match all the different types of data that you can create with Haskell. So this is kind of complicated, but as you can see, this is something that's coming from functional programming that's slowly arriving in mainstream languages. N not for any reason. It's just because that is really, really useful and really, really expressive. So what does that mean for OO in general, for the way we program. So this is a classical OO object, right? And this is what I learned about OO when I started. So an object has some hidden state, some identity, and all of this is encapsulated with nicely defined methods, and the behavior of a given method can change based on what's inside the internal state, but you don't get to see what's inside it. And that, that's, what an object, that's what an object is, and it can communicate with other objects. But now we are talking about more and more putting all of this apart, putting the functions on one hand and make them pure, putting the data on the other end and make it immutable. Wow, that's, that's a very different way of seeing the world. So in a way, what we are doing when we do this, we are moving away from OO. It's, it's a different way of seeing the world. And I, I think there's a fundamental reason for it, is that OO, especially with mutation like that is super hard to get right because if you picture all those objects talking to each other uh, composing their state with each other you get 
a combinatorial explosion of states. What can happen? I don't know, because it depends on so many hidden variables. It's very hard to predict. Most of the behavior of that system is going to be somewhat emergent, right? It's like a colony of ants. You know how each of one is programmed. You don't know what's going to happen with the full colony necessary. So I think we're kind of moving from this kind of problem. We don't want this anymore. And there's another domain where we are probably also moving from this kind of domain. And for me, it's kind of interesting because when I was sold OO and how people were selling OO like in the 80s uh, was for UIs. And UIs were like, were like the perfect candidate for OO. You have all these widgets, they have their own internal state, they communicate with other widgets, they are, can be part of a hierarchy of widgets where they have some common properties about having a border, or having some buttons and stuff like that. It was like the, the perfect candidate for, for using OO, right? But maybe 20 or 25 years later, people are coming back from this idea of thinking, oh, maybe it's not such a good thing because of what I said, it's very complicated in terms of state management. It becomes really complicated. And people in Haskell have been wondering about that for quite some time and came up with some very simple concepts about modeling the behaviors of something as a continuous function of time, modeling what, what is an event, something that happens at discrete moments in time and finding some ways to compose those things to get more elaborate behaviors. And it turns out that this is just extracted from the documentation of one of the libraries to do functional um, um, programming, uh, reactive programming in Haskell. And with the right combinators, well, you can definitely describe what happens to a data structure that is representing your UI. And, and this is all composable, and it has nice properties. You can reason about it. You can know, you know what, what's, what's happening with it. And you possibly you went to other talks in this conference to, telling you about React and telling you exactly about those things, how we, how we extract the state from the functions just to make the darn UI that are so complex a lot more manageable. So in a way, this might just be the last nail in OO's coffin. Uh, I'm not predicting that OO will die tomorrow because we have such a huge inertia in everything we're doing. It might take one, maybe two or three more generations, I don't know. But I really get the feeling that we have this strong influence of functional programming moving us away from OO uh, slowly but surely. Um, to go where? Well, to go to a world of smart functions acting just on dumb data. And uh, I think that's quite nice. So the, the first part was really about how Haskell and functional programming languages in general make us see the world differently as functions, taking data, dealing with data, extracting it, describing behaviors, things like that. But one very big characteristic of Haskell is that it has a very good and very elaborate uh, type system. And I want to give you some examples of that today. Um, as Java or C-sharp developers, you are used to use a type system, but maybe you don't realize that there are types beyond types. There are other types that could make your life easier that you never even thought about. So let's have a look at that. But before we go to the complicated types, I want to show you what you can do just with the simple types, because it's really nice. This guy is Jaron Minsky. This is not a Haskell developer, he's an OCaml developer. But he, he coined this phrase that's really great, is we should make illegal states unrepresentable. And that's a great way to get correctness in our software. So if you have no way with your software to build a state that's illegal, if there's no concrete way with your API, with whatever, to build that, you're done. There's no bug. It's, it's like correct by construction. So how can we do this just with the tools I presented? Just data and types. Well, one way is to create specific data types just for a given usage. Let's see an example. Let's say you say, I want, I want a list where that list should never be empty, empty for some business reason, whatever. I know I have some identifiers in that. That thing can never be empty. So it's, and, and that's important because if I extract an element, I want to make sure there's always one. That can never fail in production. I take the head of the list, there should always be one. 
In Haskell, it's very simple. You create a data type for it. And what does that data type say? It says, I'm to create an element, a value of that type. You need at least one element, the first A, and then you can have a list of other elements. And that, that, that list can be empty, it's not a problem. But you will always have at least one element in your, in your data type. It is correct by construction. And then you provide functions to act on this data type. And you cannot provide any kind of functions. So you can, you can provide map, because map is going to transform each element in that non-empty list, that's fine. But what is the operation, for example, that you cannot provide on this collection? Filter, filter. yeah, filter is super dangerous. Or at least you cannot think that filter is going to return a non-empty list. So then you have to say in the type of filter that it has to return a list, because possibly you're filtering everything out, right? And then your software will exactly tell you, the, the compiler will tell you uh, exactly what it is. You can push this logic uh, to, any, to some complicated uh, business logic. So I did a full presentation on that subject uh, a few years ago, where I was showing how I needed to synchronize files between S3 buckets, a Hadoop cluster, and some EC2 machines. And there were some scenarios that were just not possible. Because, for example, you cannot run a computation on an S3 bucket. So I had to eliminate those scenarios. And I, was, I showed how you could encode this in some types. And because data types are very cheap to create in Scala, they are very cheap to create in Haskell, you don't think twice about creating them. You just create data types that are appropriate to your situation, and then the compiler will force you to pattern match everything. So the compiler will tell you, oh, you forgot about that case. That combination, it can happen. What do you do in that case? And then you say, OK, th in this case, it's OK. I can, I can proceed to the next step. Or this case is just not OK. I need to stop here and tell my user that what he's trying to accomplish just cannot exist, does not, does not make any sense. So that's a very easy way and nice way with simple things to make our software a lot more reliable. But we can do more. Um, who knows this guy? Ah, oh, many people. But maybe the other ones, you know him by his secret identity, his super lambda man. So this is Philip Wadler, and he's known to go to conferences and change his outfit and be very spectacular about it. So Philip is one of the creators of, of, um, of Haskell, and uh, <clears throat> I think he has, he has had a very strong influence on a language like Java just because he was one of the persons designing generics for Java. So as someone coming from Haskell, having well-formed types everywhere. I think when Philip saw that in Java you had list of objects, he was like, no, we cannot let the world happen like this. I need to do something. That's my mission. So he teamed up with Gilad Braha and Martin Odersky to propose something. And it turns out that to add generics to Java, you need a bit of research. It's not entirely obvious. One thing that makes it a bit hard is that you have subtyping in Java, something that you don't have in Haskell. And that's, that's an important point. I'll, I'll come back to that. And because you have subtyping in, um, in uh, Java, you have all these phenomena that you have to tell your user about. Oh, is this thing covariant or contravariant? So, for example, OK, a list of oranges is probably a list of fruits. That's fine. That should work. Not the other way around. But there are some situations where the relationship is kind of inverted. So if you're doing testing, for example, and you have matchers to match values, and if I have a matcher for an orange, I cannot match any fruit with that thing. On the other hand, if I have a matcher for fruits, I can probably try, uh, um, on, try it on my orange. And wow, subtyping makes things so complicated. It's hard. So one thing you discover when you come from a language like Haskell, where you don't have subtyping, and when you try to, to do stuff in languages having subtyping, is that something that you think as a nice T, subtyping, oh, it's a is a relationship. There's everywhere is a relationship. They are useful, they are nice, they are a good way to model the world. They actually make your, your life a lot more difficult. One place where they, they make your life more difficult is with type inference. So in Haskell, you have very good type inference. It's very rare that when you write an expression, you have to specify what's the type of that expression, what's the type of some part of your expression. 
That makes it also a very productive language because you don't have to type th that much and you can transform your expressions and you know that the types will just follow. Java, uh, when it was created and proposed to the world, people say, wow, that's a great language. But also we, we discovered after a while it's also a very verbose language. You have to hold the, the hand of the compiler and tell him, hey, this type is this. And if you don't put all the types at the right place, the compiler will not know what you're talking about. And it should be able to. So the diamond proposal is a way to reduce this gap between a language like Haskell and a language like Java. Okay, with the diamond proposal later, we were able to say a bit less. That was good. And then we are going to have in, in Java um, local variable type inference. Even better, even less thing that you have to specify. And it turns out that it's possible to improve the compiler so that those small and mundane types, you don't have to use them uh, anymore. It's uh, to, to write them anymore. So that's great. But unfortunately, uh, what you will not get is super type inference. Uh, I mean, I extracted a paper which is not very old, like last year. People are still researching what's the best way to have subtyping, polymorphism, and type inference. This is still not, it's still a difficult problem, right? So something that you think is nice, subtyping, turns out to be causing problems in lots of different areas. And I think what Haskell is showing us is that it's completely possible to write very generic programs with lots of reusability without subtyping. And that might be surprising, but it works. It is possible. And it is possible in particular because in Haskell, you have a great capability for abstraction. Um, I'm going to give you one or two examples, and we're going to see how this plays with the type system. Now I see articles like this, monoid for Java developers. What is a monoid? And even the other M word, the monad for Java developers. Now, let's do a quick poll. Who knows what a monad is? Okay, so awareness is growing, right? That's good. Maybe now it's a lot more familiar. It's familiar because we hear more and more about it. Now there are libraries in Java where you can just use those concepts. Functional Java, Waver, there are books about it. That's good. If you use Scala, it's, you will, will hear even more about it. I mean, you go to conferences and the word monad is pronounced in almost every talk. It's hard to escape. And functional programming in Scala is even so good that people created two libraries for it. One was not enough. Let's create two, right? Let's do it. And even in a language like Kotlin, um, all those concepts are also arriving in Kotlin. Uh, not because it's fancy, because they are super useful. Because people, for some reason, like Kotlin. But if they come from, from Scala, they will really miss those, those concepts. They really make their life easier. So let's have a look at something that is directly imported from Haskell that help us represent those concepts in other languages like Scala, like Java. And this thing is called a type class. I must say that the first time I saw the word type class, I didn't know what they were talking about. Is it a class? Is, so it's, it's not a class. It's not a class in the sense of an OO class. It's a way to classify types. It's a way to say some types have some properties and some other types, they have other properties. Let's take an example. So this is the monoid type class. And this says, I have for, the, for a type A, I can do things. I can have an element that's always going to be the empty element. And this type A, if it has an instance for this type class monoid, I can always ask for the empty element. Or this type A allow me to take two values of that type and smash them together, append them to produce a new one. So if I say it like this, it's very abstract, and you might wonder, what is it talking about? What does that mean? Well, a very simple example is int. So the type int, you can provide an empty element, that's zero, and you can provide um, an append operation, that's plus. But there are many, many other types uh, where you can describe those, uh, those two operations. So you can describe this for string, so you can concatenate two strings. You can dis use this type for lists. You can concatenate to lists. You can use this for maps. That's, hey, that now it starts being useful, right? When you want to concatenate maps, you have a very standard way to, to concatenate maps. Um, and once you have this abstraction, 
where it doesn't really depend on the type that's going to implement this abstraction, you can describe some very generic functions, like sum. So you take a list of elements, and you don't really care what they are. It's not your problem. The only thing you know is that they have a monoid instance. And that's the only thing you need to know. And then you can specify how all the things can be added together. And you can use it on a list of doubles for some computations. You can use it on a list of strings that are separated by new lines, for example, to do some display. You can use it in many different contexts. Uh, so this sum operation becomes like a super uh, Swiss knife. You can use it in many uh, different contexts. That's great. But in Haskell, we can go even one step further in those using those type class, and which uh, you can generally not do with languages not having such um, um, sophisticated uh, type system. You can use higher candy types. So the name is terrible. I mean, it takes some time to understand what, what is a higher candy type. I'm using types. It's difficult. So let me try to give you a hint about what it is. Um, you have list of A's, which is the case where you have a collection of A's. You have a type that's option of A. That's the case where you can have an A or maybe you have nothing. You have a type which is future of A, which is you will have an A, but sometimes in the future. Another type is either of A. You might have an A or you might just have an error. It's a B. Stop. Stop here. No more computations. All those types, they share some kind of similar shape, right? They are more or less some kind of M of A, right? And it turns out that for all those types, you can implement a very useful um, operation, which is flat map, where you take an M of A, you apply a function from A to M of B, and you end up with an M of B. And with this, you can uh, flatten list of elements, you can um, flatten some options and map and flatten some options, you can do uh, asynchronous programming with futures. It is such a useful operation to have. It's one operation, takes some time to think in your mind. Once you know it, you can use it everywhere. This is great. And in particular, this will avoid this kind of problem. So this, uh, this happened today on my, on my reading list. People fighting over the meaning of uh, array.prototype.flatten, conflicting with the previous JavaScript library that had the same method doing something else. So people, because they are reinventing the wheel all the time, just not taking the time to learn what is a monad and just putting the right name on top of it, you are bound to have those kinds of conflicts. You are bound to invent new names to work around the fact that you failed to identify the right abstraction when it was needed. Because actually, this abstraction is everywhere. Monads, you can find them in many different contexts. And you have the same issue in uh, Swift, for example. So Swift, they have three times the flat map operation that should actually be defined just once with one very specific type signature. And because it's defined three times, there are different semantics attached to it, and it makes things complicated. So it's very nice to have a language where you can define type classes for those kinds of types. The types like M that take all the types as parameters. So like list that take an, I an int and produce a list of int that are like type constructors. And this, those types are the types that we call higher kind of types. And they are in Haskell. I mean, they are, you can use them very easily in Haskell. And they are so useful, again, that when people want to do type classes because they want to do functional programming in Kotlin, well, they propose to evolve the Kotlin compiler to include higher kind of types. They are super useful. And I was actually very surprised to realize that even in Java, people actually already did it. So there is some kind of encoding of higher kind of types that you can do in Java using annotation processors. It looks crazy to me. I would rather use Scala than resorting to this, but, well, some people, they, they really want to use Java, but they really want to use functional programming, so what do you do? You do this kind of thing. That's just amazing that you can do it. So, in Java, you're exposed uh, in, in mainstream programming languages with subtypes, generics, but I really encourage you to have a look at all the other types that you can find in a language like Haskell, and are probably to come near to you. So higher kind of types, but you will find that there are rank n types. Oh, what does that mean? I was 
when I was programming in Scala, I thought the same. What does that mean? And then I realized, oh my God, that's exactly what I need. So this is how you, you learn those things. As you need them, you realize, oh, that's the thing. Or maybe you can just go to Haskell directly and you will learn it from the source. But there are existential types, there are dependent types, and dependent types are even even more so interesting that there's there are languages based on that that are even better than Haskell just to learn about them. And Idris is one of them. So this is Idris is a Haskell-like language where you can actually have functions returning types. You can have functions on types. That's what what makes them dependent. And with this, you can make write some code that's where again. Correctness by construction happens in your code because you have the right tools to do it. So that's pretty cool. So we've seen that the Haskell influence is definitely in the functional programming, use functions and data, is definitely in the type system, how to make type systems better so that we can get more abstraction, things that can be reused over and over again. I want to show you now that there is also a great influence in terms of libraries. There are many libraries um, about Haskell that in Haskell that people don't know about, but that are just great. And um, I want today to tell you more about some of those libraries. I, I cannot do all of them, all the ones I like. I don't have enough time to talk about them. So of course, there's just the, the basic functional programming libraries where you have all the monoid, the monads, uh, all the other abstractions like traverse, uh, foldable, uh, what else? semi-group, um, I don't know. Ma many other that are just useful for, for um, applicative, very useful, uh, for day-to-day for -day programming. But there are other libraries. One of them is really interesting, and it's also very, very mind-boggling. Mind uh, just learning this library will take you probably a huge amount of time, because you will have to learn many concepts. But it's actually quite useful. Uh, it's just not for the fun of learning. Because as soon as you say, oh, we have immutable data, well, you generally also have immutable nested data. Data inside data, inside data, inside data. And if all of this is immutable, I mean, as a programmer, you come up in to work one morning and you say, oh, I want to modify that small field here. Uh, how do I even do this? It's immutable. Do I have to reconstruct the full structure and so on? That's super tedious, right? So lenses are a solution to that problem. Lenses are a way to describe those transformations so that they are very short, very reusable, very composable. So you have a lens to one part of your structure that you can compose with the lens to another part of your structure to make a bigger lens. Um, and it's very um, nice to learn about that. And for example, lenses has been already ported to Scala almost word to word. I mean, you have to adapt it to a different language. But there's a library in Scala called Monocle doing the exact same thing because it's just so useful. You can do things like modifying all the, all the, the leaves in your tree, for example. Something that's tedious to write with lenses is just easy. It's called a traversal. Just do it. Very useful for JSON, right? So there are, there are lots of applications where this library and any library that you can derive out of this um, is going to be useful. Another one is QuickCheck. So QuickCheck is a testing library. So um, who is doing property-based testing here? Not a lot. OK, so I can see this is still not a concept that has, uh, sorry, that has really come into mainstream. So the idea with property-based testing is that instead of writing tests one by one with, by inventing some values and then uh, running a function, checking the results, you will start by describing generators for your data. Ways to randomly generate data that you are going to use, right? And there's lots of support in the library to do this uh, elegantly in a very composable fashion and so on. And once you have this, you describe properties. You describe something where you say, for anything you give me as an input data, I want my property to be true. And QuickCheck is a library that's going to execute those properties. And by default, it's executing that property 100 times. And sometimes, and you can crank it up to 1,000 times if you want, 10,000 times. I personally solved a bug, which was horrible. It took me three weeks to solve in Java by getting some help for, from ScalaCheck by running something um, 34,000 times until I was able to find a way to reproduce the issue. So QuickCheck is a very inspiring library. Streaming libraries. Also, very interesting, streaming is a difficult problem. Haskell has many has different take on what it means to stream data. I really encourage you to have a look at it. 
And in general, everything that has to do to, with concurrency and um, something called software transactional memory. I've never been comfortable write, uh, using Stretch in, in Java. I can tell you I'm a lot more comfortable do the, doing concurrent programming in Haskell. It feels a lot safer to me, a lot more understandable. OK, but not everything is rosy in the Has Haskell world. There are some issues, and um, you need to be prepared to this uh, if you want to have a look. For example, I think modules are lacking a, way to, a good way to, in a way, to describe interfaces and hide, do some kind of software components. Um, I think a language like um, SML or OCaml has a lot more abstractions to do this. I think this is really missing from Haskell. Garbage collection, there's a ton of work that has been done with garbage collection in Java. There are even more um, improvements coming up to the next version of Java, improving the latency and so on. Uh, the story here for Haskell st still needs to be improved in some places, so I think Haskell can really learn from that. You see, it's not a one-way avenue, just Haskell teaching others how to, do, how to deal with life. I think it can incorporate more. Records. The situation is very embarrassing in Haskell. So records are like just data types, but with names for the fields. And it turns out that by default, you have two different um, re records, and the names will just conflict if they have the same name. It's, it's just annoying. There are many ways around that. I find none of them is very satisfactory. So I would really wish that Haskell would just do some name, name spacing like we, like we have in OO and solve the problem once and for all. And finally, IDs. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, the ID situation is not so good in Haskell. If you want a good programming experience, you will have to assemble different things and maybe tweak them, and maybe some of them will break from time to time, and you will get nothing that's really close to what you have in IntelliJ and Java, where the flow feels very, very natural to do, to do many things. So, I hope I have demonstrated today that Haskell as a language, as a, like a reservoir of ideas, has been very influential to many other ecosystems, uh, and is probably going to do so. I really encourage you to have a look at the real thing. Uh, just take some time, just try to learn, just write small programs, make mistakes, spend some time just not understanding what, what's happening, but try to give it a go. You, you, you will not regret it. And that's it. You have questions. Yes. Thank you for that talk. I, I have two questions, in fact. First of all, you, you still haven't answered how do you do I.O. in a ah, Okay. Um, the second one is for a noob who just wants to play around, what would you, what would you like? A good book or, or a good IDE? Or yep. Okay. So um, how do you do I.O.? Um, Essentially, monads have been invented exactly for this. So, in Haskell, you don't like print line like that. You return a value that's going to describe how to print a line. You, you return an I/O of unit in that case, and this is still functional because in, you don't do anything. Just return a program that will have to be ex executed, and eventually, your whole application is an I/O value that has some I/O effects. And the runtime is taking care of unpacking all those actions and executing them. So that's the trick that people found on how to do I.O. The second question is how to get started. There is a fabulous book called um, Haskell for All. No, Haskell for All is the name of a blog. I think it's called the Haskell book. Uh, uh, you, can, you can have a look at it. We had reading groups in my company just taking the book, doing all the exercises one by one, uh, trying to learn from that. Start a reading group with the book and uh, that would be great. In terms of environments, um, the, the plugins for VS Code are not too bad. I think they could be better. Um, um, I would still recommend to use Stack as your building tool, but maybe later you might want to move to Nix. There are still some debates uh, around what you should use as a building tool. Um, IntelliJ, there are two plugins for IntelliJ. You can also start with that if you're comfortable with IntelliJ, because you will stay more or less in the same environment. Uh, I think those those will be good starting points, yes. Um, can you maybe comment on F sharp? Uh, for example, the IDE support could be much better there, maybe? In, in F sharp? Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, I've, um, yeah, I've never been an F sharp user. Uh, 
I just know that it's kind of a variant of, uh, of ML for, for C Sharp. I know that they pioneered some interesting ideas like, um, what is it called, the type, ah, the thing when you can, you can have your types like be modeled out of Wikipedia and then um, help me here, I don't remember the name, you don't know? Okay, okay some, some, some very cool things they can do by basically uh, created, creating all types uh, um, at compile time that are being checked but that come from representation in the database for example. So th there are some very interesting ideas here. But I don't know about the experience. I would love, I mean if I had to do a C, C sharp project, I would probably try to do some F sharp first before doing anything else, yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, so I'm available after if you want to ask anything. Thank you.